Hi guys, <clears throat> we have a gorgeous Sunday morning sunrise unfolding here on this gorgeous Sunday morning worship here in the Church of the Church of Doom here uh, on this beautiful Sunday morning. That would be Sunday, February sixteenth, twenty twenty here in the paradise of uh, Inverness, Florida. We're right outside Inverness, Florida on my brand new piece of property I just closed on a couple of days ago. Uh, this is where I am digging in my heels, at least in the winter time, to survive the collapse of global industrial civilization and whatever else is coming along the way on a waterfront property in Florida. So anyway, wish me luck on that. But what I love about Sunday morning, of course, is I get to wear both hats here uh, in the Doomosphere and uh, bring you both my Sunday Doomsday Sermon. And while I'm here, I will also make this my Monday Chronicle of the Collapse for February 17th, 2020. So, anyway, several of you have sent me, this will be a fairly short and sweet sermon. Uh, several of my alert listeners have sent me this new, I guess you'll call this an article, out of The Guardian. Came from, the, out of, showed up in The Guardian yesterday. Uh, written by none other than Christiana Figueres and Tom Rivet Karnak. Christine Figueres. I'm having a senior moment. Uh, she was either, she had something to do with the, it was at the IMF, uh, I think it was the I. It, it, anyway, uh, was it? She had something to do with one of those, with the UN or the IMF or the World Bank or one of these planet-eating organizations. I'm not sure who this Tom Rivet Karnak is, but whoever these people were, they were what the Guardian calls the architects of the Paris Climate Accords. So they were the architects of the Paris Climate Accords. We all know the famous Paris Climate Accords, the absolutely joke document from 2015 that will do not, that will do absolutely zero on any level to save this planet. So anyway, just, just so you know, so, uh, anyway, the Guardian has chose to, they have chose the quote, the only uncertainty is how long we'll last. The only uncertainty is how long we'll last, which is a worst case scenario for the climate in 2050. Okay, so what we have here, this is excerpted from a new book, The Future We Choose. The Future We Choose, a new book by the architects of the Paris Climate Accords, offers two contrasting visions for how the world might look in 30 years. Okay. So, uh, they have two different visions. I'm not going to go into the hilarious, hopium-drenched, filled version of the little uh, fairy tale ending. You can go on here and read this yourself. So, I'm not sure how many pages the future we choose is, but apparently... Christina and Christiana and Tom chose to give the worst case scenario, you know, the meaning the honest opinion, 11 pages. So apparently they spend 11 pages saying what will happen 
with business as usual, which is exactly what is going to happen, although actually business as usual is going to ramp up. So it's going to be worse than this worst case scenario that we're getting ready to read. So they spend 11 pages uh, showing us a a probably pretty rosy version of the worst case scenario under business as usual and then they spend the rest of the book apparently however many pages that is talking about how we are going to turn this around you know from everything from uh, consumer and lifestyle choices uh, for instance to there might be a buzz going on here Con our consumer and lifestyle choices uh, our world leaders our politicians our technology and all of this are going to save us in the next 30 years you have to get the book the future we choose to find that a uh, happy horseshit, but let's get a dose of reality of what this what the world will look like if we do not make a radical a radical change to every way we behave on this planet like in the next six hours all right <clears throat> take it away Christiana and Tom it is 2050. Beyond the emissions reductions registered in 2015, beyond the emissions reductions registered in 2015, we're already starting off here in fantasy land, no further efforts were made to control emissions. We are heading for a world that will be more than 3C warmer by 2100. So remember this is this is a voice from 2050. My guess is we will be pretty close to 3C by the time this is written in 2050. Okay. The first thing that hits you is the air. In many places around the world the air is hot, heavy, and depending on the day, clogged with particulate pollution. Your eyes often water, your coughs never seem to disappear. I can I know about that. You think about some countries in Asia where out of consideration sick people used to wear white masks to protect others from airborne infection. Now you often wear a mask to protect yourself from air pollution. You can no longer simply walk out your front door and breathe fresh air. There might not be any. Instead, before opening doors or windows in the morning, you check your phone to see what the air quality will be. Fewer people work outdoors, and even indoors the air can taste slightly acidic, sometimes making you feel nauseated. The last coal furnaces closed 10 years ago. Oh yeah, the last coal furnaces closed, in t meaning in 2040, but that hasn't made much difference in air quality around the world because you are still breathing dangerous exhaust fumes from millions of cars and buses everywhere. Our world is getting hotter. Over the next two decades, meaning from 2050 to 2070, projections tell us that temperatures in some areas of the globe will rise even higher. An irreversible development now utterly beyond our control. Oceans, forests, plants, trees, and soil had for many years absorbed half the carbon dioxide we spewed out. Now there are few forests left, most of them either logged or consumed by wildfire, and the permafrost is belching greenhouse gases into an already overburdened atmosphere. The increasing heat of the earth is suffocating us, and in 5 to 10 years, meaning 2055 to 2060, 
vast swaths of the planet will be increasingly inhospitable to humans. We don't know how hospitable the arid regions of Australia, South Africa, and the western U.S. will be by 2100. No one knows what the future holds for their children and grandchildren. Tipping point after tipping point is being reached, casting doubt on the form of future civilization. Some say that humans will be cast to the winds again, gathering in small tribes, hunkered down and living on whatever patch of land might sustain them. More moisture in the air and higher sea surface temperatures have caused a surge in extreme hurricanes and tropical storms. Recently, coastal cities in Bangladesh, Mexico, the United States, and elsewhere have suffered brutal infrastructure destruction and extreme flooding, killing many thousands and displacing millions. This happens with increasing frequency now. Every day because of rising water levels, some part of the world must evacuate to higher ground. Every day, the news shows images of mothers with babies strapped to their backs, wading through floodwaters and homes ripped apart by vicious currents that resemble mountain rivers. Yep, there will be no end of uh, images of mothers with babies strapped to their backs. You can better believe that. That ain't going to change over the next 30 years. Anyway, where were we? <clears throat> News stories tell of people living in houses with water up to their ankles because they have nowhere else to go. Their children coughing and wheezing because of the mold growing in their beds. Insurance companies declaring bankruptcy, leaving survivors without resources to rebuild their lives contaminated water supplies, sea salt intrusions, which I saw down there in the Everglades, with the Everglades already going under the ocean here in 2020. Sea salt intrusions uh, and agricultural runoff are the order of the day. Because multiple disasters are often happening simultaneously, it can take weeks or even months for basic food and water relief to reach areas pummeled by extreme floods. Diseases such as malaria, dengue, cholera, respiratory illnesses, and malnutrition are rampant. <clears throat> You try not to think about the two billion people who live in the hottest parts of the world where, for upwards of 45 days per year, temperatures rocket to 60 degrees Celsius, otherwise known as 140 degrees Fahrenheit, a point at which the human body cannot be outside for longer than about six hours because it loses the ability to cool itself down. Places such as central India are becoming increasingly challenging to inhabit. Mass migrations to less hot rural areas are beset by a host of refugee problems, civil unrest, and bloodshed over diminished water availability. Food production swings wildly from month to month, season to season, depending on where you live. More people are starving than ever before. Climate zones have shifted, so some new areas have become available for agriculture, read Alaska and the Arctic, while others have dried up, read Mexico and California. Still others are unstable because of the extreme heat, never mind the flooding, wildfire, and tornadoes. This makes the food supply in general highly unpredictable. 
global trade has slowed as countries seek to hold on to their own resources. <clears throat> countries with enough food are resolute about holding on to it. As a result, food riots Coups and civil wars are throwing the world's most vulnerable from the frying pan into the fire. As developed countries seek to seal their borders from mass migration, they too feel the consequences. Most countries' armies are now, in 2050, just highly militarized border patrols. Some countries are letting people in, but only under conditions approaching indentured servitude. Those living within stable countries may be physically safe, yes, but the psychological toll is mounting. With each new tipping point passed, they feel hope slipping away. There is no chance of stopping the runaway warming of our planet, and no doubt we are slowly but surely heading towards some kind of collapse. And not just because it's too hot. Melting permafrost is also releasing ancient microbes that today's humans have never been exposed to and, as a result, have no resistance to. <clears throat> Diseases spread by mosquitoes and ticks are rampant as these species flourish in the changed climate, spreading to previously safe parts of the planet, increasingly overwhelming us. Worse still, the public health crisis of antibiotic resistance has only intensified as the population has grown denser in inhabitable areas and temperatures continue to rise. The demise of the human species is being discussed more and more. For many, the only uncertainty is how long we will last. How many more generations will see the light of day? Suicides are the most obvious manifestation of the prevailing despair, but there are other indications. A sense of bottomless loss, unbearable guilt, and fierce resentment at previous generations who did not do what was necessary to ward off this unstoppable calamity. And there you go. Uh, this has been an edited extract from the Future We Choose Surviving the Climate Crisis by Christiana Figueres and Tom Rivet Karnak, published by Manila Press. To order a copy, go to guardianbookshop.com. There you go. And I will definitely put the link. Uh, okay, and they have four related stories. So I guess the, the flip side to this... The Hopium one, they titled, quote, Air is cleaner than before the Industrial Revolution, a best-case scenario for the climate in 2050, if you want a real knee slapper. Then they have an interview with Christiana Figueres on the climate emergency, titled, This is the Decade and We Are the Generation. Then David Wallace Wells weighing in with a story, quote, There are many cases of climate hypocrisy, and do not forget an interview with Greta Thunberg, quote, They see us as a threat because we are having an impact. You tell them uh, Greta Thunberg. 
but the sun is on the rise on this absolutely gorgeous Sunday morning. Uh, so I need to get out there and enjoy this beautiful day. We are racing the clock to get a flush toilet, to get an outhouse uh, ready here. And uh, it'd be a nice little piece of global industrial civilization. Uh, this five gallon bucket is getting is getting old but anyway so I need to I need to get out there and enjoy this gorgeous day on this beautiful planet while I still can I suggest you do the same and if you enjoyed this sermon or chronicle please spend a few seconds to uh, thumb it up if you did not enjoy what you just heard you can thumb it down and please subscribe while you're over here. Bye, guys. Can you hear the sand hill cranes in the background? I don't know what the various songbirds are. That honking in the background is not geese. That is the sand hill cranes. I love the sand hill cranes. Bye, guys.